Okay. Cool. Then, yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the 13th session of, of the Kai Lectures this winter term. And today we are going to talk about neural models. So it's all you've been waiting for. Yeah? Causal AIs. Yeah. What do these AI research know, researchers know that we don't know yet, right? Is there a secret causal GPT suddenly, right? Um, well, yeah, in a nutshell, there is not, right? This is all ongoing research. Um, but of course, you know, uh, we are trying to do our best and, and hoping to cultivate minds which can help in this uh, important endeavor. Yeah. So how is the lecture for the day structured? Similarly to, you know, the, the last couple of lectures that we've had where we just went over, well, current research and, and papers. Uh, we are going to do the same today, uh, but we're just going to focus on two papers. But for that, you know, the, the first part is going to be a little bit uh, lengthier. Uh, we are going to talk about, you know, deep learning. We're just going to do a quick reflection, cover some quick basics. And then I have these two papers, which, uh, funnily enough, uh, both appeared uh, at the same conference in the same year, um, do very different approaches to, to causality. One is the intervention of some product networks from our lab. And the other is the neural causal model, which already puts the neural in there and it's, it's more classically aligned with both Perl and, and, and deep learning. Um, actually, one of the students here right now, Bennett, who is sitting in the back, uh, he could also be talking about this because in the seminar he was talking specifically about this. So if you get bored, you know, or if I say something wrong, just correct me. Uh, and yeah, so... Without further ado, let's start today's lecture. It might be a bit shorter than usual, so we're going to use some more time to, you know, dwell over each of these aspects. Uh, if you want to, also in more detail and in, in, in a more interactive way. Um, if not, then it's just an earlier Friday, right? Okay, cool. So a brief re reflection on deep learning, right? So, so how did we get here, and right? how did we get to this all this craze uh, that we're experiencing currently, but really over the whole past ten years? Well, I would say it's really the success of deep learning, right? I mean, here yeah, I have two examples that I'm showing you. The famous one from uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo, which was able to beat the uh, Go game-playing uh, uh, champion at that time. Uh, really a, a, a dominant champion in Lisa Doll. Um, Go is known as this more intuitive game, which is a lot more complex when it comes to the number of board positions possible for the game when compared to say chess. Yeah? Um, and this was the first breakthrough uh, a la, you know, deep blue IBM from the 90s essentially, happening in the 2010s, right? Um, obviously now recently spreading quicker than, you know, any of the social medias like, like Twitter, Instagram and so on, ChatGPT and all these transformer models, large language models, right? I mean, I guess a lot of us are using them nowadays. I do for my research. I know my colleagues do, and I guess also the students do in all kinds of ways. Um, and really all of this is deep learning, right? So it might have kicked off, you know, in the 2012s with the so-called ImageNet moment where we had AlexNet, uh, you know, with one of the actual uh, co-founders, uh, Elias Sutskeva from OpenAI, um, you know, having this subhuman error, right? Like the superhuman performance on something like image classification. And then, you know, it just kept going and going. Um, but these are, you know, these bigger breakthroughs uh, in, in practical terms, which are also very nice from a, uh, you know, promotion viewpoint, right? And that, you know, you can show it to people, people who are not into AI or not into technical fields and can, can still appreciate what is going on and, and sometimes might even be afraid, right? I mean, public discussions, AI ethics, alignment and so on are well undergoing. And well, deep learning, how does it work? It re relies on, 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 on two things essentially, right? So, so one of them is this universality of, of, of neural nets, right? That uh, they can essentially approximate any function and all these tasks are really uh, predictive in nature, right? So given the, the state of the board, it's my turn. What should I play next? Right? Predict me the position, right? Or ChatGPT. Given the whole context of our conversation, what is the best next word, right? So, so really, it's down to the predictive, right? There was even an interview by Yuda Pearl himself back then, where he was saying in a, in a kind of down-looking manner almost, you know, all the achievements of deep learning really just amount to curve fitting, right? And while technically, in some sense, true. 
obviously it's underplaying, downplaying that, you know, there's a lot of effort in not just science, but engineering and, and, and all aspects which flow into making these models do what they do and achieve something as big as this, um, you know, uh, kind of seem irrelevant. And, and uh, yeah, obviously it's also a provocative statement, right? You can also see it as polarizing in the sense that, you know, I want to promote also my framework. Uh, but then again, it's important to have these discussions, right? Um, and yeah, so, so that's kind of the neural nets, right? We're saying, okay, uh, they can achieve anything and then it's really optimization, right? And so it's just single word, but there's a lot going on there. Uh, Moritz could actually tell you we were just talking. So we have one paper submission in work for ICML and uh, yeah, the model is uh, not optimizing as we wish. Yeah, but we got to figure out, you know, uh, what's going on, right? Debug, figure out and eventually it works. And then maybe uh, Moritz's work is also going to appear here next. Yeah, so let's see. Um, but yeah, really also maybe one other aspect, which is amazing is that it's all these different areas, right? So you have games, chatbots, as we see here, we have ImageNet with vision, for example, but we also have speech, we have navigation. Think of Google Maps. I mean, I'm using it all the time, right? And, and, and I guess many, many other users are also, you know, living off of it, yeah? And so, yeah, it's amazing to see these technolo technological advancements and Essentially, they're all based on some kind of predictive AI model. Now, where does this all initially come from? So, so let's take a couple steps back, right? Like, you know, Frank Rosenblatt and, and these people, you know, really the inspiration is the brain, right? So the twin discipline of cognitive science and, and maybe even neuroscience. If you look at the human brain, right? So all of us here, <laughs> we all have it. And on average, it consists of, you know, people say 100 billion more specifically, it's 86 billion neurons, right? So it's these cells, but that's not the special thing, right? It's not just, you know, that it's these cells that live in the brain, which we call neurons. It's about the connections, because if you look at the typical liver of a person has, has a lot more uh, cells, there's a lot more liver cells, and we don't go just by the number of uh, these cells, right? Like your liver is not, not your brain, right? Um, the important part about the, the brain is that the neuron is highly connected to any other neuron, right? So cell interconnectivity is a lot stronger, significantly larger for the brain than for any other organ. So on average, any neuron has a thousand Facebook friends, right? And real friends. Um, and yeah, that really amounts to ridiculous large numbers, right? So 60 trillion. So 60 times 10 to the power of 18, right? A lot of zeros, as you can see, I just, you know, just to, to show it, right? But even that cannot appreciate this, this, this big of a scale, right? Like we are notoriously bad for understanding the scale. Uh, another Euler Pearl reference, right? So people are always ask him, well, yeah, but how do we scale our causality, right? And he's, he's like, I cannot understand, you know, 10 variables, let alone five, right? So how should I talk about 60 trillion or, or, or I don't know, 100 billion, right? So, so that's really kind of uh, the thing, yeah? I mean, this is just sheer amount of scale. If you are on social media, say also something like TikTok or so, you, you might be knowing this meme where someone is comparing with grains of rice, the wealth of Jeff Bezos to, to any other person, right? And obviously it's in the billions, right? But, you know, just Lamborghini is really just a, a, a grain of rice, right? But... Typically, an average person would never be able to afford even, even just a single grain of rice, right? That, that's just going to show how, how ridiculous these scale comparisons are. Yeah? What's also very impressive about the brain from a neuroscience perspective is that it really just weighs a kilogram, right? A bit more than a kilogram, one and a half kilograms, right? And it's very compact, right? Like it's, it's dense. Right? It's really dense. So also for everyone who's more keen or, or trying to be more faithful to the neuroscience, if you look at any of these images where you have these, you know, like splash photos, stock photos, and there's neurons and they're firing, right? And there's a lot of empty space, black space. That's not true. <laughs> it's dense, it's packed. There's no space whatsoever in between, right? There's a whole field dedicated to this, which is called connectomics in neuro neuroscience, where they really try to map the brain on a neuron lab, in a sense, trying to be safe with a, with a hypothesis, right? That whatever the brain is encoding, it's somehow at least on uh, on a neural level. Well, that's kind of the inspiration from the brain, right? And we see those numbers and that's kind of the trend we are seeing right now, especially, right? With these transformer models with GPT and so on. Yeah? So there's this big thing called the, um, the scaling hypothesis, right? 
So there's these nice articles you can find online by Gwern.net, who also talk about this, you know, famous uh, urban legend of the tank. Uh, but we're not going to go into that. We're talking about skating hypothesis here. And we see Jeffrey Hinton, one of the Turing awardees for deep learning, right? Alongside Yashua Bengio and Jan LeCun. And he was tweeting in 2020 even, right? I mean, when we just, you know, we're talking about GPT-3 and not 3.5, 4, chat GPT and so on, yeah? And, you know, it's it's all in the scope of these emergent capabilities, essentially, that, well, maybe we just need to scale because of the fact that we observe these performances, right? So to read out loud once more what was written here. So Jeff was really saying that extrapolating the spectacular performance of GPT-3 into the future really suggests that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is just 4.398 trillion parameters, right? So obviously alluding to the fact that, you know, we're just scaling these things and suddenly they work, right? Like deep learning back then, yeah? I mean, we have known backpropagation and these algorithms from before the 90s, right? But we didn't have, you know, Google Maps and these kind of things the same way we have now uh, back in the 90s, right? Like we were just starting, I guess, with, you know, home internet for most people, right? And so um, really what we're seeing here is that kind of this, this, uh, this, um, this uh, scaling factor of this whole situation is very important, right? So in 2010s, right, because gamers, you know, they need awesome graphics, right? So they were pushing, you know, the GPU market. And then some other smart people were like, wait a minute, this bad propagation would really benefit from these GPUs, which do this insanely massive parallelizations, right? So, so let's just try it and boom, ImageNet and these things. Obviously, I'm also downplaying a little bit, but essentially that's how I remember the story at least, right? And, 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 and then, you know, it kind of repeated with GPT where, oh man, large language models, we're talking about foundation models, which are defined somehow, not just because they are, they are on, a, on, a, on, a, on a different paradigm setting, but really because they are on a different scale. They are bigger than everything we have seen before. They can actually compare in numbers, right? We are talking about trillions in numbers with, with a brain, for example, with a human brain. Yeah? And so, yeah, that's the big question of the, 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 the scaling hypothesis, right? Like it, it kind of proposes that anything we see, awesome behavior, anything generalization is really emerging as a consequence of the fact that you can do so many computations, right? Um, and even someone as, as renowned as Jeff Hinton, right? This is just, you know, whether you know you should take this, I guess you should take this uh, with a grain of salt in the way he formulates the second part of, of the second line, right? Because he's going for answer of life and, and things which fundamentally probably are, are not answerable by any means, right? Um, but yeah, so so that's kind of how, how this goes with scaling up us, right? Um, and you, we see again, it's the, uh, the, the, you know, brain metaphor, right? And, and, and that really goes for the whole neural net game, right? So a neural net, an artificial neural network, artificial neural network, right? It's really just the brain is a neural network and we are making it somehow mathematical now, right? We're trying to capture it in a computer, in a program technically. Yeah? So we can go another step back, right? Because here we are talking now about bigger properties of the brain, right? We are scaling it, but it all started with just abstracting a neuron, right? So for everyone who might have not had anything deep learning related, right? Um, you know, neural cells, right? Neurons, uh, you know, transmitting electrical and chemical signals, you know, typically along this axon, right? And then, you know, there's these synapses, they pick on to other neurons and uh, it can be, you know, different places. Typically it's these dendrites, right? They are like an antennas. And that really is for your central nervous system, right? The communication, your brain, um, the brain stem and everything else. And, and that's how it kind of looks like. Right, like the, the, the cell body, right, uh, with the soma. Uh, obviously, this is a schematic illustration, but kind of very close to actually what we see in actual brain tissue, right? Um, how did we do this? Or how did researchers back then do it? We didn't, but other smart people did, thankfully. Well, they did it like this. They said, yeah, let's just treat all these synaptic incomes as inputs and as input of the same type, essentially. They're all just inputs, right? Um, they can, you know, be maybe, you know, distributed uh, along, you know, different dimensions, but essentially they're just, you know, it could, I mean, different modalities, but they are essentially all just inputs, right? And then we have this weight factor, 
right? This is kind of indicating how in a brain synapses, you know, some of them are somehow stronger and easier triggering, right? While others are, are more inhibiting, yeah? Um, and we would just represent them maybe by a scalar number, right? We're just saying, okay, input X1 is weighted by W1 and so on and so forth, right? And then in this bigger nodes, right? This is kind of now this triggering aspect of an, ax, uh, of an of a neuron, right? So if a neuron gets excited enough, right? Then it'll just fire, right? That's typically how we say it. And, and, and this is gonna be captured now by these two units together. So first of all, obviously, excitement how is it you know calculated well it's somehow collected right it's like everything which is happening every every input you receive is somehow going into this so we're just really taking the sum right we're just having this weighted combination of the inputs but now how do you do this you know triggering aspect like when do you trigger how do you do this decision function well typically we do this with what we call an activation function and non-linearity where we say something like oh, okay if, if the threshold is passed then we say on, right? Then we say firing, then we send the chemical signal. And if it's zero, not. And that's really what we have as an output there. And it's all mathematized, right? And this is typically what we call artificial neuron. That's really at the basis, right? Like how you would learn that at the basis of this laptop, right? Or any of these devices or your phone, are, you know, bits, right? Transistors, you know, who, who are either on or off, right? And then in the whole collection, right? They write a memory and, and then there's a processing unit. And then there's you know, assembly. And on assembly, there's, you know, addition, subtraction, jumping, and so on and so forth, right? And eventually you have this high level interface, right? You're always abstracting and, and going onto a higher plane of, of, of reasoning, essentially. Well, how can we capture maybe this intuition a little bit, you know, visual in the sense of what they then are able to do? Well, I think this is a nice visualization. So what we're seeing here now is uh, data fonts uh, on essentially these two dimensions. And then, you know, our inputs are really now dictating these decision boundaries. So, so how we take them, for example, on X1, right? It's coming from the horizontal, this red line. On X2, it's coming from the vertical, the red line, right? And, and one of them, you know, is a bit closer maybe to the green than the other one. And now if you stack them together, right, via the sum, that's really how the, uh, decision would look like, right? So, so you, you essentially get these four regions. Now, obviously, you're going to weigh them. You might say that, for example, this, this first dimension is a bit more important than the other one by, you know, increasing the weight here, and you plug it through the nonlinearity. And essentially what this does is, well, create you this nonlinear decision bound, right? So what we can see here is there's two types of data points indicated by the colors. So we see green data points, right? I mean, this could be, say, an embedding of images of cats and the other could be maybe dogs, right? And now our neural net is perfectly fitting this thing, right? I'm not talking about optimization yet, although I was using the word fitting and, and perfectly fitting, right? But really this is what happens next then. You, you try to, you know, find the best thing, right? Who says that we land here with the optimal right away, right? It might look like this after initialization first, right? Say X2 was weighted double as, as X1, right? And then we see there is the decision boundary is now shifted to the right um, because kind of, you know, the X2 trend, right, going down there becomes more important. And so what happens naturally is that a whole bunch of, of dark images now get wrongly classified, right? But that's really essentially what's happening, right? So the parameters that we learn are these weights, right? And, you know, whatever architecture we choose, how we want to connect the neural net, which kind of nonlinearities we choose, right? These are so-called hyperparameters, right? These are things we set usually before training and then, you know, go with the training, try to figure out the best thing, right? Um, and typically, how do we do, you know, the automatic part, which is then, you know, say back props, slash the gradient descent, via loss functions, loss functions, which are functions which somehow should capture what we want to do with the model. If it's, you know, uh, regression, right? Then we opt for something like a mean squared error because we are saying, our model predicts some kind of real value and we have these actual real values. Let's measure somehow the distance. And the further away it is, the more we are gonna, you know, scold our neural network. That's really how it goes, right? And you'd be surprised how simple rules like this, right? Could really push something just like Conway's game of life, right? Like you have this population and it's infinite patterns which can come just from like two, three simple rules, right? And, and that's also what happens then with, with learning, right? With deep learning. So you, you connect them a lot, you stack them, you might have some other inductive biases, 
But then, you know, you feed them a bunch of images, a lot of data, right? Typically we say they're data hungry. And then what happens is almost magical, right? That, you know, there's kind of a, 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 a categorization, a, a kind of clustering into different concepts, abstractions happening across the layers. So what we can see here now is a deep net, right? Which has been trained on these image data. And it's very well at predicting not just these, but also, you know, test samples, which, you know, are also, you know, images of just faces, stuff like that, but could, you know, have different colors and stuff. And really what this model has learned is in, you know, layer one, kind of these weird looking uh, gradients, right? So, so these, these overall gray images, but with, you know, blobs where there's like black and then white kind of indicating that there's an edge. But then in hidden layer in two, what we're seeing is we have somehow now, you know, subcomponents of a face, which we would conceptually capture, right? So say an eye, say a nose, an eyebrow, right? And then in hidden layer three, we actually have kind of abstractions of a whole face even, right? And then again, they're all building on top of each other, right? So in hidden layer one, you have those, you know, edges essentially, because with edges, you can get these more complicated concepts of, you know, these body parts, and then, you know, taking body parts together again and combining those, you get these faces, right? So that's really what's happening now, right? With the deep learning. And the crazy thing is that it seems we can always somehow, you know, have new ingenuity to push optimization further and, you know, end up with amazing uh, things, right? So it seems like improvement is, is, is inevitable, right? So for, for example, what we see here now is um, training days, right? for, you know, these AlphaGo models, which were trained for this uh, board game. And on the y-axis, we see the ELO rating, which is, you know, the typical rating you use for Go or chess to indicate, you know, how strong a player is, you know, in the, in the community, in the pool that they are competing in. And what you can see is there's a quick improvement over the first couple of days, then it slows down, right? But it still keeps on improving, right? There's no stopping to it, even after 40 days, right? And what we see here is that the dash line was the, the model which essentially beat Lisa Daw, right? Like the reigning champion, the dominant champion at that time. And then, you know, AlphaGo Master was another model which was introduced afterwards, which was already significantly higher in ELO rating. And even that was surpassed by AlphaGo Zero, right? And then, you know, DeepMind playing their game, they did Mu Zero, right? Where they then also could, you know, do multiple games, chess, shogi, alongside Go. Um, but really that's that's the incredible thing to see, right? And yeah, how did the data come here? Well, it was self-play, right? So there was actually no human intervention, no historical data. Obviously there's nuances. Uh, if you wanna know more about these kinds of models, uh, Johannes from, from our lab, our colleague, he works with these models all the time, so he knows a lot. But yeah, that's kind of the, the thing, right? Also, this is now secret information. I have you know some colleagues at DeepMind, right? And they helped me actually get some nice stuff, which I'm showing to you. So this was from the headquarters, how they actually trained these models, right? And I was shocked, but it kind of makes sense, hindsight, right? So yeah, what you're really seeing is that, yeah, stack more layers and you know, it, it somehow works, right? And so you have this amazing contrast now between, you know, there's actually, so you could ask more with me or some of our other colleagues um, who are on Twitter, right? All of us, we didn't want to start Twitter, actually. We are a bit more reserved, a bit more hesitant, right? Um, but to our own good, our seniors were pushing us a little bit, right? And I don't regret it. I, I mean, sometimes I do, but generally I don't, right? <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing is, really, it's crazy. Like, so, at, at some times, right, for example, the thing with, you know, um, these, these uh, scaling hypotheses, say, there was this whole discussion about, you know, deep learning is hitting a wall, right? On the one hand side, you had this camp, you know, with Gary Marcus, who also wrote this article with this title, uh, you know, on the neurosymbolic, which I myself find as well, right? Because causality is symbolic, essentially. And I think there's conceptual things lacking still. But then again, there's, you know, these people who always prove you wrong, right? Who just, you know, do stack more layers, right? And then after every thousand layers, there's somehow, you know, a new achievement unlocked, right? So it's 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 incredible, yeah? Um, and then, you know, obviously no one has really an answer, right? And and they just ground it in what they know and what kind of biases and beliefs they have, right? It's, it's a lot of times it becomes philosophical and also really counterproductive, yeah? Um, but at least we have it, we're having a different, right? 
Um, but yeah, that's the question. Is it fundamentally limited? Yeah, and and some of these Twitter, you know, discussions are hilarious, right? There was once a time, really, Gary Marcus and Jan LeCun, the other Turing awardee, they were going at it, right? And it was just, you know, some people were like, you know, oh, did you hear the news? And I'm like what? Uh, and and then Gary. Gary Marcus and Jan Lecun, yeah, okay, another day in the office, yeah. So they would always, you know, push, yeah, and, and it, it would become, you know, the community would become conscious of it, essentially, that they were just fighting over, over all these things, right? Um, yeah, but essentially that's it, right? Like, maybe the, the key lesson here is don't underestimate Twitter, don't underestimate the opinions people have outside their papers, yeah? There's, it's, it's spicy, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, but that, that's really it, right? Um, now, obviously, I've talked a lot about deep learning, trying to give a context for this today's lecture. But after all, we are in a causality lecture, which is fundamentally symbolic, right? But we can ask this question now, deep learning and causality, right? What's going on there? So one of the you know key arguments that Yuda Pearl himself was also giving, especially for LLMs, was something that, you know, where, where he said, so there was this quote by, you know, Jitendra Malik was saying like, you know, these LLMs, they are not foundation models. They don't have foundation whatsoever. They're just castles in the air, essentially. Yeah? And then, you know, people like Yuda Pearl were actually doubling down on this by arguing, however, with, well, actually an argument, right? I mean, previously you were just saying, I think that's the fact without giving reasoning. At least, you know, Yuda Pearl was, was giving the reasoning by saying that we have a theorem, right? We have the causal hierarchy theorem, which you remember from lecture three, maybe. And in that theorem, what we're saying is that this causal hierarchy we're seeing, doing, and imagining is always strict, right? That means that going from observations to interventions or counterfactuals is impossible. It's not doable. You cannot do it, right? Unless you have certain assumptions. And these assumptions involve, you know, the structure of the problem, right? And you can be very wrong about this. And so, yeah, Europe was saying, like, it's amazing, it's incredible, wow, I didn't expect this, but it's impossible. It's it's a theorem, right? Unless someone messed up the theorem, but, you know, like, it's a theorem, you know? And then, actually, so Moritz and I had a work where we introduced the so-called causal parrot hypothesis. We're going to do this in the next lecture a little bit, but what we essentially did was analyze conceptually the LLM capabilities when it comes to causal inference and causality. Yeah? And what we proposed in this hypothesis was essentially, hey, LLMs at least, they can, in principle, encode assumptions about the structure, which you need to do causal inference within the LLM. And actually, and that's pretty cool, because Yuda Pearl reacted to our paper. He was actually even changing then his opinion based on our paper, uh, even, even doing an interview with... Uh, the American Society for Statistics, where he was saying that, well, yeah, the theorem still stands. It's not in a contradiction, right? But if they can somehow encode that and reuse that, then it might work, right? We still have other arguments why it might not work, right? But in principle, that's kind of the, the part of the hypothesis, right? And so, yeah, this is an open question. It's a very hot topic, right? I mean, I'd say this is, you know, it's, it's kind of very... Impossibility results flavorish, right? So what I'm saying by this is that, okay, I mean, if you prove this or this prove this, right, it's not gonna change, not gonna give you now a new model which you can just deploy in practice. But it might very well, you know, stop re unnecessary research or elevate research which still needs to be done, right? So, so this is not a model kind of result. It's a, it's a foundational thing we are kind kind of discussing. It's a very difficult problem. It could be a, a lot of error cases, right? But kind of this is, you know, the, the little, um, you know, hints that I want to pose and, and, and the little seed I want to plant in your brains, at least for this lecture, right? So what are we going to do today? Well, neural models, right? We talked about deep learning now, or neuroscience, or neural nets, deep neural nets, and a little bit about causality. And if we go now back a couple of years, so we are in 24 now, and if we go back to 21, which is the papers I'm going to present today, then certainly at that time, neural nets, you know, they were not discussed in the language of causality, right? At least Pearl's causality. So today we are really just Pearl in causality, no other notion that we've seen from the past lectures. And it's going to be somehow with neural models and it's going to be model centric, right? And really, in a nutshell, right, the too long did not read for this lecture, really. 
Um, NCMs, these neural causal models, they provide SCMs where the neural nets are simply structured, there's the structural equations, right? Like the structural equations are just neural nets. And causal circuits, such as the interventional subroad network, the ISPN, they equip regular deep learning models, although they are a niche in this particular case, with correct causal inferences. That's really kind of what, what we're doing here today. So before we move on now to the next one, any thoughts, questions, impressions, anything important I forgot? Do you like deep learning? Yes. And they made or the model managed to find an exploit where when you just place your stones around the perimeter of the whole board after the whole level notices, it kind of always gets out there. <laughs> That's interesting. So so I've not seen that paper. Um, but yeah, it, it I mean this sounds very keen to adversarial attacks, right? Where you know you do something which seems totally stupid to the human, totally unreasonable. Uh, you know. Again, like the panda image always, right? Like we have a panda and then, you know, we just put some kind of noise in a particular way. But somehow now the neural net panics and says like, oh, it's a gun, right? Although it's still a panda, right? And it sounds similar, right? Like the neural net is like, oh, what is this guy doing? So, 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 so the sad thing is that we as humans now, we cannot look into this model, right? Like let's assume for the moment this model was conscious and was having some thoughts, right? man, this thing was freaking out in that moment, right? It sees that it's placing like this and it's like, this this is so stupid. I've never seen this like before. Not even the stupid humans do, humans do that, right? So it must be something outlandish which I cannot compre comprehend, right? So I give up, right? It feels like that at least, yeah? So, so yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with that story. Anyone else, anything on deep learning? Do you, do you like how, you know, neuroscience is, you know, intertwined with deep learning? Do you think it should be more or less? Or do you like the notion of, of the neuron as it is abstracted? Are we missing things? I mean, I guess if you don't have a neuroscience background, this might be, you know, a tough question, but yes. Uh, do you know that the second one is I'm very confident that this points to two research areas, essentially. One of them is where our colleague, who's now a professor, actually, Martin Mund, right? He also has this lecture on continual learning, and that's how this area is called, right? That's typically where you have, you know, tasks and where you're trying to counter, you know, issues with, say, neural nets forgetting over time, right? They learn something, you train them on a new task, they suddenly forget the old things and just learn the new stuff, right? So that's related. Um, and there's a lot of things going on there. Even just the definition of continual learning is kind of up to grabs, right? Important is it's reasoning about change. So it's very similar to causality in that sense, although causality is less about learning, right? At least you know, pure causality. Uh, the other thing is is compositionality and, and works on these things, right? Where really you, you can you can also split neural nets or you know you can kind of split the the, the task, right? Some people might also that's more like I guess an idea, right? And that is in multiple fields, say reinforcement learning, right? Where, you know, you want to learn how to open a door, right? But you got to know how to reach, you got to know how to close your hand, open your hand, and these kinds of things, you can split them. And then, you know, there's analysis when you do everything end to end or when you stack them together, what happens, right? Um, so yeah, 100% there's a lot of work uh, on, on in this area, right? But depending on the specifics, you know, you might end up in very different areas. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then let's move on. If anything, right, today, I guess we have a little less stress, right? So, so let's just enjoy ourselves. But yeah, we're going to kick off with the first reference, uh, work from our lab uh, in collaboration with the folks at 
you see that is actually that's a coincidence i didn't put this on just because i <laughs> like i swear um yeah so professor shriam natarajan and his student uh, atrish karanam who uh yeah UT dallas um shriam is a long time colleague of, of and friend of, of christian and they do amazing work especially in reinforcement learning but also in causality right so kind of we we teamed up on this one and well on spns and these kind of things so so yeah make makes sense um, so yeah, let's kick off maybe with what SPNs are, right? Because not everyone probably has heard, you know, uh, about SPNs. Uh, if you had probabilistic graphical models with Christian, then you will know what they are. But nonetheless, we can just repeat. Essentially, they are deep models, right? They are they are neural nets, right? Just a special kind, right? They are not the the neuron abstracting way that we have seen previously, right? So. So when this is our classical multi-layer perceptron with inputs, weights, and intermediate layer, output layer, then this is just a special instance, really, where there's three different node types, essentially. Right? There's these leaf nodes, which are really just like our input. Then there's these sum nodes right, with the plus sign. And then there's these product nodes with you know, the cross, the, the x, the times sign. And that's the name, some product networks. Right? That, that's where it comes from. Yeah? And an SPN is a circuit, a so-called probabilistic circuit, right? Um, why is it called a, a circuit? Because, well, it's just like a circuit. It's a computational graph. Why is it called a probabilistic circuit? Because it has proper probabilistic semantics. So a neural net, obviously, you can, you know, treat the softmax output as some kind of, you know, uh, imposed probabilities. Uh, obviously, you can look at, you know, Bayesian semantics of neural nets, right? Bayesian neural networks and, and really give them a proper, you know, uh, non-point estimate semantics or so probabilistic semantics. But, you know, these PCs, they are from the ground up built that way, right? So they are kind of natural when it comes to that, right? And the cool thing is, so SPNs, they are a special case of these circuits yet again which satisfies certain structural properties like decomposability and so on. And that really makes the inference tractable. That's kind of the key selling point, I guess, of these models. Whereas, you know, lack of explosivity is still the reason, I guess, why you haven't heard as much outside of these specialized labs um, when it comes to these models. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, a lot of progress has been done um and even the community itself is growing there's grants and professorships you know just dedicated to this uh, research area but obviously you know there's no spn based chat gpt at least i'm not aware right and yeah so that's in summary an spn a probabilistic circuit with certain structural properties it's a DAG, really right with these three types of nodes it's not as strong yet but it's very quick yes <laughs> yeah, so we have tried that there. It's, yeah. it's unfortunately not as easy, right? Like that's that that makes neural no, nets compelling still. So actually, I I visited um two years ago the lab of uh, He van der Broek. He's a full professor now at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, the alma mater of Professor Pearl, right? And um, he is actually well. He is his name, but also he, when I just say the pronoun, right? But like, don't confuse it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, he is very interested in um, yeah, really making this, this work, right? Because there's so many, so tractability is a key thing. You want to be efficient, right? You want to have, you know, I mean, we as computer scientists, I guess we're naturally inclined to time complexities and stuff like this. Maybe we even sometimes forget, but the other ones are typically not even aware of the thing, right? Um, there it's more about, you know, the, the qualitative aspect, right? Although even the analysis itself, of course, is of qualitative nature. And, and they are very interested in, you know, scaling these things up so that essentially they just become the new neural net standard, right? Because again, tractable inference, proper probabilistic semantics, right? And that's two big, big factors. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, it's not that easy, right? Learning and everything. But then again, it's a lot, long, uh, a lot younger field, right? So... Uh, Poon and Domingos in 2011 actually proposed this SPN model, which was based on, you know, these arithmetic circuits by Adnan Davish and others uh, from earlier. But really, it's been kind of the last 20 years, I guess, something like that. But neural nets, I mean, they go back to the beginnings of AI and even computer scientists, science, right? Like 50s, 40s and so on. 
Uh, everything you can read on Schmidt Huber's blog if, if you're interested. Um, so complexity. So we are talking about complexity. So let's talk about the Rubik's cube. Typ typically, I would have one right now. I just have this stress ball here. Um, but it's you know this is a classic three by three by three uh, cube, right? Um, and um, this thing is solved. If you haven't, you know, I guess everyone has seen this, but this thing is solved if, you know, there's these center pieces, for example, your blue, red, yellow, which you can not move. And, you know, if the faces are all in line according to these clusters, so this side is blue, this red, and so on, then the cube is solved, right? And obviously there's a lot of ways you can scramble this thing and permute the colors. To be precise, I counted this. This is <laughs> trillions of positions, yeah? Uh, again, we have high numbers today, right? Like trillions of neural connections, trillions of positions for, for Rubik's cube. I mean, just think about it: forty-three, and then you know, eighteen digits. That's insane for for a thing again, which is just this big, right? And it's very simple moves. It's not even continuous in any way. It's it's very discreet, right? Um, and what's even more shocking now is, in 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 up to max twenty moves, any position can be solved, right? That's why they sometimes in Rubik's cube they call this God's number, right? 20, right? Because this is like the limit, the hard limit. We, we can do it, right? And that's pretty cool, actually. Um, and so, yeah, we can see, you know, we can count possible positions, possible futures, right? Um, we can bound things. That's all discussions about complexity. Yes. Yes. So I, I mean, I would have to find the paper now again. I haven't looked at this in a long time. But this is as, as far as I understood it, right? Like n equals 20, that's God's number, right? And that's the the, the limit, right? Like any no no no. So so the the, the what the, oh okay. Whether this is the the the, the supremum essentially, right? The least uh, upper bound essentially. Um this I'm not sure, and this I'm not sure. This we would have to check, interesting question. I would believe that this is because this was the last thing I looked up, right? And I think that they have really, you know, overstudied this kind of, right? For it just being the Rubik's Cube, right? But man, people can solve it. I, I used to solve this thing in like my best times, a little bit below 30 seconds. I mean, the world record nowadays is like, I don't know, three seconds or something like this. I, it's insane, it's literally insane. Um, but yeah, uh, we would have to check that, right? If you find something, just post on MetaMost. Yes. Yeah, um, there's actually something called the anti scramble Like we complete the anti solve cube, the um, position where you need the most moves to get back to the original. And I think from there you need 20. Uh, I it was well, it, will, that you it would have to be 20 exactly yeah, then, right? Yeah. And that will be your answer then, right? If, if this is true, then this is your answer, right? That essentially, because there's the anti solution, it might be that, you know, still it's one position out of all the trillions or maybe a handful, right? Um, but that would be interesting. It would be interesting to quantify how many such anti-cubes anti there exist, right? If they... I mean, it would be insane if out of all these positions, there's like one antagonist, right? Like that would be insane, right? But that's an interesting, right? Not just the numbers, but just, you know, how how this behaves on, on a complexity level, right? Um, but yeah, so let's remember for a moment complexities, right? So this is, you know, now OG theoretical computer science, right? And uh, if you have not heard from him before, but Aaron uh, Aronson, uh, Scott, Scott Aronson, you know, that's, that's his name. He is a, a former MIT professor. I think former, I think he's with a different university now. But he had this awesome blog and then, you know, he compiled this blog to, 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 to a book which is called Quantum Computing Since Democritus, one of the most amazing books I've ever read. And I'm not even that much into, you know, computation complexity, not actually not, not even, you know, close, right? Um, but he just writes amazingly, right? So, so check it out, right? It gives nice introductions. There's a lot of cool things here. Um, if you know about P and P, right? Like these are these, you know, foundational questions of computer science and even, you know, maths. Um, but really, what we're doing just like now, when we're analyzing the Rubik's Cube, in a sense, you know, we can classify problems by their solvabilities, right? By their solvability properties. Um, so, for instance, when, you know, a problem can be solved by a deterministic Turing machine, right? So, a general purpose computer, really, right? Like my laptop here, your phones, 
in a polynomial amount of time, computation time, right? Then you know this we would classify as complexity class P, P for polynomial, right? Um, but then you know there's all kinds of different other classes. For example, ones where you can only verify the solution, right? I can give you a list of moves for the Rubik's cube. You might not be able to solve yourself, right? But you can verify the solution easily, right? Something like this. Uh, this would be the class of NP. And then there's the famous uh, question whether these classes are the same or not. But NP, you know, non-deterministic Turing machines, polynomial time. And now you can also talk about space. Uh, you can go into the quantum realm, right? And, and that's this whole study. It's a whole, you know, subfield of computer science and maths itself, right? Now, there's even more specifics to this, right? At least some basics that I just want to mention. There's these two notions of hardness and completeness, right? We typically call a problem hard, not because you just cannot solve it and you think it's hard, right? No, because any of the other problems in that class that you have identified uh, or could ever be identified would, you know, reduce to that problem essentially. What does that mean, really? It means that it's the hardest problem in the class, right? Or it belongs to the set, which are all the hardest problems in the class. So in a sense that, say say now, uh, Rubik's Cube is uh, NP hard. It is an NP and it is, it is a hard problem. Then that means that essentially any problem in that class of NP, say playing Mario perfectly or something, right? I think there's even a paper on that, actually. And that it can re re be reduced to, to the Rubik's Cube solution, right? That essentially, if you can solve Rubik's Cube, then you can also play Mario perfectly, right? There is, you know, then algorithms, how you transform these inputs, right? But that's not the question now, it's just in principle. Um, so essentially that kind of qualifies why they're the hardest problem in the class, right? Because essentially any problem that you're trying to solve will depend on you really just solving that problem as a at least subroutine essentially. Right? Um, now I said, you know, Rubik's cube is NP hard, right? Actually, I'm also writing it here. Um, if I know it's it's an NP actually, right? It's if it's kind of proven that it's really in that class, and not say now in sharp P or whatever as well, then uh, it's called complete, right? It's really a complete NP problem, right? It's it's the hardest type of NP, and it but it's purely an NP problem. It's it's not in any other class, right? And that's really what we kind of define here. Now, to just give a little bit more intuition on you know, these complexity classes, I think this is an amazing example. It's a lot of fun always. Focus on the top one for the moment, the top row. We see a person going to their boss, right? This is you know new PhD students coming to Christian, right? I've seen it, yeah? And you know they go to Christian and say, I was not able to solve the problem, right? First of all, Christian is gonna tell them, it's not a problem, it's just an issue. Problems are fundamental, right? But then, you know, he's going to scold you, right? Like he's going to teach you to do it differently, right? Like at least, you know, say Christian is nice. He's not going to fire you. He's going to teach you, right? But, you know, a different boss would just say, yeah, go screw yourself, right? <laughs> um, that's really, right? Because you're, you're going there and you're just saying, yeah, I cannot solve, right? Maybe you're also explaining a little bit how, where you failed or something, but that might just make it worse even, right? But really, if we focus now on the bottom way, complexity classes teach us how to do it the right way. So you're starting with the same thing. I was not able to solve the problem. And then you see the veins popping and, you know, person is angry and so on. But then you say, but in fact, look, I, I brought an infinite number of people here. No one can do it, right? That's the amazing thing about complexity class, right? Like if you say it's NP hard and we know for sure, then that doesn't mean we cannot solve it. We can still, you know, brute force our way in this efficient algorithm somewhat, right? But at least, you know, conceptually speaking, right? It's not my fault, right? I'm dumb, but everyone else is too, right? That's the proof you're providing, right? And that's actually pretty cool. So with this now, we are actually equipped to talk about tractable inference. That was a little detour. We basically needed essentially. But the definition is that a class of queries, which we denote by the symbol Q, is tractable for a family of probabilistic models M, just say these are all the possible sum product networks we've just seen, yeah? If and only if, for any query that you could take, right? Any question you can ask any of your models really, will compute exactly. So you get exact answer QM in polynomial time, in the size of the model. That's what's written here, right? So big O notation, poly is the class of all polynomials, 
and then you're taking the, the size of M, right? So the class of queries tractable for family, say the family of SPNs, if you know any SPN could answer any query exactly, not approximate, in polynomial time, in the size of, of, of any respective model. Obviously, this class of polynomial covers a lot of ground, right? So, you know, we have something like the typical cubic, right? Say so things like matrix multiplications, uh, linear, which is really nice, right? It's just like snap, it works. But also, you know, high degrees, right? Like x to the power of this year, yeah? So that's really the definition of tractable inference, right? So whenever you find someone talking about this in the realm of circuits, that's really what they mean, right? And it all comes again from what we've just seen now, complexity classes, right? We're talking about these things, right? An important note, that's why I put it in bold, is exactly right. Typically, if you opt for relaxing your problem, being kind of in some kind of epsilon error range, then, you know, obviously you reduce complexity classes, but even then you might not solve everything actually. And here's a good example. So let's now jump back to causal inference. Causal inference is actually intractable. Let's focus on the first bullet here. Cooper and others, you know, in the 90s, they actually proved that exact inference in Bayesian networks, right, is sharp PH, problem class, which is worse than NP, where you not just try to find whether, you know, a solution exists, you actually have to count all of them. And then when you relax that, you don't have to count anymore, right? You would end up at NP-hard, but it's still NP-hard, and it's just approximate inference, right? And then how many situations can we think of where, you know, being approximate is not enough, right? You're writing a test, and you're like, oh, yeah, I think if it's something like this, you always get a point less, right? And that's a low-stakes example, right? Think of, you know, the large hydron, like large collider, right? And physics experiments or... Or say some some safety critical stuff in, in you know a, a robot manufacturer right so a robot a, a robot using manufacturing company right um, yeah so so that's essentially what we have for a long time now but then you know people actually started in stop talking about these things you know then you know the Perlian craze started and everything but then actually last last year we we published a work which kind of brought this up where we proved that, well, Cooper's results, they were predictive of their time. They were, you know, they're really ahead of their time in that causal inference in any SCN, right? That's a strong result, is intractable. So in any SCM you could consider, even the NCM we're gonna look at today or something, you cannot have always the fact that, you know, any query will, you know, with any any model instance will 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 be in polynomial time. They'll be worse. They'll be somewhat exponential, right? And really, where does this result come from? Well, SCMs, historically speaking, are just an extension of this semantic graph that we know as the Bayesian network. They mainly enable counterfactuals by introducing exogenous terms. So you can also talk about hidden confounders and some other things. But really that's what's happening, right? So here we have this nice plot from Bongas and others who have the causal Bayesian network at the center. There's a lot of, you know, SCM variants in between here, but really this is the one we typically know, the SCM here on the odd circle, the CCM you can ignore for the moment, right? But really the SCM is just extending the, the CBN. We also know, we have seen it, for example, the FBN, the functional Bayesian network, that's just a different name for the SCM. And that's a naming which really highlights this relationship, right? That it's coming from the BN. Um, can we illustrate this? Can we look at, you know, how causal inference is actually intractable, like get some intuition? Yes, we can. So what you see here now on the left side is, well, an SDN and a Bayesian network. Fundamentally, one is a computational graph in a classical sense, in a, in a circuit sense, whereas the other is a semantic graph. So the edges in the graphs denote different ideas. So here you have x1 to x4. Could be, you know, I don't know, the sprinkler is on, and so my grass is wet, but also my, my roof might get wet, right? And this denotes causation, as we have seen it with SEMs with causal graphs, right? This is a causal graph. But now here you have the same variables, and they might reappear at some different positions. And now you say, like, oh, OK, so grass is wet, and sprinkler, they are somehow factorized, whatever. It's, it's a lot less clear how to interpret this. Yeah? Um, but then, in terms of inference, they become drastically different, right? 
So here we have just some input scaling n equals to one, two, and so on to 100. If it's O n, if it's linear, right, you're going to be at 100, right, times some constant. But if it's exponential, like two to the power of n, I mean, for 100, you're here in a, in a number that I cannot even pronounce, right? I mean, even a lot earlier, I could have not pronounced, right? That's just scale 100, right? Say this was the number of variables you're looking at. I mean, 100 variables is not much, right? We always make this social network example with millions of variables, right? But even in a med medical setting, you might already be at hundreds, right? So yeah, that's kind of the, the thing, right? So SEMs fundamentally, they're intractable. They inherit this really from the BNs because they're semantic graphs, right? These computational graphs, they are our hope, but they are less interpretable, but you know, we accept it, at, you know, and then now we're trying to look at, you know, some causal notions and, and, and things like that, right? Try to get that back in a sense. You know? And well, one of these models that we're gonna look at specifically now is the SPN, right? SPN intractability. SPNs, they satisfy certain structural properties as I've said in the beginning, and that makes them tractable and actually even linear, linear in the size of the network, right? And the size of the network, you know, characterized by, by the DAC essentially of that graph. And that one doesn't explode, right? Like you could now make the argument that you know, it's not a semantic graph anymore. There's computational graphs. So there's redundancies amongst, say, leaf nodes and stuff like that, right? But it doesn't explode, right? It's not like, oh, I just converted and now, you know, it's linear, but it's an exponential graph. So what's the point? No, that's actually not happening, right? So we have a moderate, you know, we have a regular size graph, um, but it's linear in that graph. And so it's actually uh, efficient. And the cool thing, you know, people like Heath van der Berg, but also Antonio Vergari, uh, Who's a professor in Edinburgh and so on, they have this very nice paper on, they call it the Atlas, right? Where they actually have a catalog, right? They catalog, catalog these uh, probabilistic circuits, right? Which SPNs belong to. And here you can see, for example, the operator sum, the operator product, power, so on. You know, if the input satisfies, say, determinism, um, you know, structure decomposability, things like that. And if the output should also satisfy that, then you get this time, uh, time complexity, right? Uh, and then this hardness result. And as you can see, uh, most of them are actually hard, but we can, you know, get, for example, you know, in the size of P or maybe here's just a product, here it's an exponential, right? But this kind of the thing, right? And now if you want to build your, your kind of circuit, you just, you know, take these things, you look at the atlas, you see like, oh, I have to do this. Oh no, I'm not allowed to do this because this would blow up my uh, complexity, right? It's, it's a nice conceptual achievement, right? And then you can play this game really, right? So what we see here now on this plot is this big O complexity chart, right? So again, with the Landau symbol, we are always denoting, you know, the, the upper upper complexity here. And now here we are just scaling, right? What is called elements is just scaling. And then the, the vertical axis is showing the uh, operations, the time or whatever. And really anything kind of linearish, right? is kind of in, in, in this area, right? Where we are, you know, okay. Yeah, we are saying it's, it's you know, uh, a fair, right? Might even already be bad, but as you see, even though it's polynomial, right? But already square, we would just say, oh man, it's horrible, right? Because eventually it's just gonna fly away. And now imagine what happens with, with an exponential actually, or a factorial, which is super exponential, right? I mean, that's really just a thing. Ideally, we are here, right? These are, you know, your efficient sort of sorting algorithms and things like that, right? If we cannot manage, you know, we would love to be here or even here, right? But as soon as you go to the right, right? And that's the crazy thing, right? Again, tractability talks about polynomial. So everything up to this exponential is actually in there, even all the bad ones, right? But the cool thing about SPNs, they are in the yellow here, right? So they are... The, the 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 least worst polynomial in that sense, right? So yeah, even just jumping one 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 polynomial degree can can affect things a lot, right? So for example, no tiers, if you recall this uh, very popular structure learning algorithm, which we also had a little bit in the coding tutorial, uh, you know, they are typically uh, n n cube, right? So they scale with the the number of variables in the graph, so that's really bad, right? Uh, it's not in the data points, that's good, but it's in the number of variables, which is just, you know, bad still. Um, but you're, you're saying like, oh, cubed is okay, right? But then again, you know, like, I don't know, a couple hundred variables or so, I, I cannot run this, no chance on a laptop, right? I can do it on a cluster, but then even that one will, you know, blow up when it comes to, to, to an actual 
big network. Um, and yeah, a lot of works were looking at how can we optimize this. It was essentially because they had this, you know, a cyclicity constraint and matrix multiplications and stuff like that, right? But now if you, you know, do some smart operations, maybe make some assumptions because your matrices are sometimes more sparse, right? Then you can actually reduce to 2.5 or something, right? But you're still in that bad area, really, right? So that's kind of where we want to go, and 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 that's big, right? I mean, one other way to look at it is how many times have you maybe been annoyed if you know the service was slow when you were waiting for your chat GPT response, right? If you haven't run programs in, in a, any classical sense, right? Well, just imagine you had now to wait for a causal GPT for, for 10 years to get an answer, right? Like you wouldn't use it, obviously. Yeah. And 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 that's kind of the tractability thing, right? Yeah. Oops. So SPNs to the rescue, question mark. Well, before our work, there was some prior works on SPN causality. And this is actually very interesting because there have been works of compiling between Bayesian networks and some product networks. And then, you know, I was like, they, they were concluding essentially that, you know, it doesn't work. SPNs cannot do causality, right? And I was like, wait a minute, I can think of 10 ways how they can do causality in, in a maybe naive way, but that, you know, it's justified in being called causality, right? So let me look more closely, right? And then I did, and what I found was, yeah, they compiled the SPNs to Bayesian networks, but what came out were degenerate Bayesian networks, right? What do I mean by that? It's essentially, right, if I, if I write it down here on the black one, right, saying we have, I don't know, three variables, x1, x2, and x3, our nodes, right? Then, you know, say x1 is, I don't know, okay, what, what could it be? The, the effect of, of, a, of a drug on, 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 say, a disease, and then a disease on your overall health well-being or something, right? That's simple causal chain in a sense, right? Our Bayesian network equipped with some parameters, then this is just a graph of course, right? Well, you could take some kind of SPS, right? I don't know, I'm just drawing something here with the with the mixture here. Say it's just a just a sum network, not a, some pro network, right? And then you know you somehow can compile to these other things, right? And get this, but you will not get this. What you would get is a graph. There's no connections between the variables. That's what I call the generate. Obviously, there's no causal information, right? So the work which came, which you know, was arguing based on this, was absolutely correct, right? It's sound reasoning. Yeah, a Bayesian network where you have no chance of having nodes. Yeah, no causality. Yeah, but obviously that's not to say now causality doesn't work in general, right? And so that's kind of what we picked up, right? And one possibility to do such thing is well look at, you know, extensions of SPNs as the base instrument, right? And we were looking at candidates and, you know, gladly in our lab, a lot of people have worked on SPNs in the past. And one of our former graduates, Xiao Ting, she uh, developed these conditional SPNs. And I was looking at them, right? And I was like, hmm, we can maybe do something here. What do these conditional SPNs really do? They are actually two models. So it's kind of a little bit unfair to call them, I guess, conditional SPNs. Sounds like just an SPN. It's actually two models. There's a neural net actually, which is kind of a controller and it's playing the SPN like a marionette, right? And there's just an SPN. So what I then define as the ISPN in this paper is really just a special case of CSPNs. So let's capture CSPNs a bit more formally. So as I said, it's two models, N and S. Oh man, N S sounds horrible in the German context. I didn't this was just neural net and SPNs, but yeah. And um, this tuple is essentially our, our SPN, right? Just like a structural causal model, it's also a tuple, right, of exogenous, endogenous, and so on variables, right? There it might make more sense to have this tuple notation because you have, you know, the functional relations being maybe the key model part, right? You can maybe make the argument with the stochasticity. But here it's really just these two things, which are really classical models, right? One is a neural net, one is a sub network. And S is modeling now a conditional distribution. That's why we call it the, the C, the CSPN, right? Conditional SPN. P, Y given X. But how does it do it? It does it by modeling P, Y given some parameters theta. And these theta are calculated. They're computed by N given the condition, given this X as input. So essentially, you know, your, your, your SPN has 
these different nodes, leaf node, some node, product node. Some nodes are typically weighted, right? It's, it's a linear combination. So these are three parameters. Your, your leaf nodes, how the distributions, you know, the Gaussian, the width, you know, and, and things like that are, are specified. These are parameters. And now your neural net, say, it takes an image as input, say, the image of a dog, and now it readjusts the parameters of the SPN to produce you the perfect dog images. Yeah? Now, if it's an image of a cat, the parameters again get adjusted to get, you know, cat distributions, right? And so that's really what's happening with the CSPN. And now the ISPN is really just a special case where X is replaced by do X. Well, how do we do that? Well, we just say that X is coming from an L2, from an interventional distribution, right? It's part of the training data. Very naive, but it does the job, right? That's kind of what we did. And that is kind of the contextualization and in, into in prior work. So let's get some intuition. Essentially, we see these two models now here. We have this universal function approximator, the MLP, the neural net, just a feed forward neural net. It has parameters theta in this case, right? Because itself is being learned, everything is being learned end to end. And then given some input, it predicts these parameters psi, and then the density estimator is actually acting on, on, on the data of interest. And you have your whole pipeline. And this is what we call the ISPN. Just optimize all these parameters again, end to end, really. You, you, you flow it through, through up until the neural network. And that's it. And you get something which can exactly, right, because it's an SPN and also in linear time, give you correct causal inference. And what we use for you know, the signaling, for this gating module essentially, for the neural net to dictate which interventional distribution we are looking at now, well, we just provide typically the graph if available because it's the most natural way for, 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 for presenting this. But really conceptually, there's no, no need for, for doing this actually. And then how does an example look like? So what we see here on the left-hand side is the Bayesian network or the causal Bayesian network uh, for the Asia data set, uh, kind of a controversial data set, but well, that's kind of what we used here. We have different nodes. So for example, whether someone is from Asia or not, whether they have tuberculosis and so on and so forth, right? Don't think of this now as true causation, right? But somehow uh, a computational causal model. And, you know, we have now these different nodes in different colors. These colors don't have any meeting, meaning they're just here to differentiate here easily with the colors in the schematic. And now if I do an intervention, say, on whether, you know, someone has a, is a lung disease, making it, you know, independent of whether they have smoked or not, we see changes, right? So if you see here, always, you know, this, for example, this yellow bar, which is tendency here. So most of the people don't have the disease, some have, and now I'm um, being very horrible and, you know, 50-50, you know, we're setting it, right? And now obviously downstream, the effects are flowing to either to X-ray to this, and these are the three ones highlighted here in this other box. And what we're seeing is the observational distribution now here, interventional distribution, and this orange dash line with the uncertainty estimate, that's really the SPN, right? And why is it a curve? Why is it not these bars? Because actually we estimate now here a discrete distribution just with the, with the continuous uh, parameterization. So we have Gaussian nodes, right? So, you know, these, these Hubbles, and there's two of them and it can just sort them and it always does it in the, in the, in the, in the most appropriate way for any of these uh, probability masses, mass, mass, mass functions. That's really what the ISPN does. It's a special case of the CSPN. It uses available experimental data, but then it's exact and it's, 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 it's quick, right? That's kind of what we wanted. And really, if we put the pros and cons here, again, ISPNs are universal, right? So, so they can really get anything and kind of get it exactly. You can train with, you know, standard procedures, you know, gradient-based techniques. So everything is fully differentiable. And inference is linear time tractable, which is, I mean, a huge advantage, not just because it's polynomial, but because it's really the best case. But then experimental data is really necessary and there's no counterfactuals. This just stems from the fact that, again, you're really just learning to approximate the distributions well and doing everything under one umbrella, right? And it's causal distribution, so it ends up being causal, right? But they itself, it doesn't understand causality in any kind of way, right? And so that's kind of the key problem. So before we move on, any other thoughts, questions, points here? Yes. Um, the, the 
So how was it here? Um, so NPE, most probable explanation, right? And these kind of algorithms. So here we were just doing um, marginal inference. Here we're just doing marginal inference essentially, right? Um, and for, yeah. The yeah, other variables essentially, and then you look at what, what comes out there. Yes, exactly. But yeah, for the specifics, this was one of the first works in my PhD, so I was like, uh, I won't have to look at it again. But then again, Moritz might know more, and then Florian, because he has done the contraction SPN party, that knows most. So if you have questions, ask. <laughs> um, yeah. Anything else, maybe to the tractability aspect or mm, experimental data? If not, then. Let me just say, you know, we have another XKCD actually here. It's on speed and danger. What we can see is two axes here, a speed axis and a danger axis. Right is fast, bottom is dangerous. We have, you know, normal sports and Formula One and these things very close to each other kind of, although we would think they are very far away, but that's just because rocket launches are just so much more fast and dangerous, right? And um, you could actually kind of also you know, replace some of these axes, right? And, and, and then, for example, this could be, you know, what is to come next, right? Or any kind of other causal causal model, and this could be SPNs, right? But then again, on this axis, you would have then, you know, causal semantics, which you would have bad points onto, right? So yeah, you could put here SPN, here NCM, and label the axis less, less inherently causal, uh, quicker, right? And you would have the same image. That's why I chose it essentially. Okay, now another work which was presented at the very same conference back that year. Uh, we also talked to the, the authors of that paper back in, 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 during that conference because it was still, you know, COVID peak times and so on. So everything was virtual really, but it was funny. So virtual conferences, uh, I have enjoyed so far a lot. I mean, you have essentially a video game character and you just walk through a little world. And if you're close to a person, actually your, your real life camera goes on, right? You can see them. So I would just scroll past people and just hello, and then just go, and I was like, what? The? But yeah, you know, you would just see see these people. Um, the one we, we didn't see was Benjo, but then again, Benjo is Turing or body, so he has other important things to do. But, but yeah, that's the other reference. So from Elias's lab with his two PhD students, they called it the causal neural connection. They also had a very similar style to our title as well, right? Like they call it, I think, expressivity, learnability, and inference. We just talk, called it, you know, causal inference with tractable prob probabilistic models. Well, it was really just, you know, first this, then the column, and then maybe that's what got us into nerds, everyone that year. <laughs> but really, this is the second thing we're looking at today. Motivation. Um, well, we have seen that, you know, neural nets, in principle, they are just using one type of data, right? They are just using observational data, which we in causality denote by this L1, the, the first rung of the causal hierarchy. Yeah? So the nature is assumed to be a structural causal model. It models the full hierarchy, but we just have data from L1. We use it to train. And so we have a neural net. It doesn't really get generated L2, L3, but it can at least do L1, right? But then again, that's the only non causal one. So we don't have a causal model. And we want to kind of circumvent this. We want to solve this, right? So what Kevin and the others did was say, well, let's look at the SEM more specifically. It's the structural equation and, you know, the stochasticity. It implies a graph, right? What we, if we use the graph to construct our model in the first place, right? Or what if there's models which are in line with a certain graph? Then we could propose something like the NCM, a neural causal model, which is really just an SEM, but with neural nets. And they still only train on L1, but because they are SEMs, they can also generate S L2 and L3. And these, most often, they're not, right? They will not correspond to, to what you seek. But can we, you know, quantify? Can we somehow reason about when they are actually similar, right? Like what it takes to get there. So how did they just define the NCM? It's a bit of a uh, hassle here, I guess, to, to go over maybe all of these, you know, indices and things like that in, in detail. But really, it's very simple. 
An NCM is a model M just written like an SCM, but we put the parameter theta explicit there as well because it's a function of, well, the parameters, right? Where V are, are just, you know, regular endogenous variables. And theta is now the set of all the thetas for each of the variables. And this thing is an SCM, right? An SCM in the regular sense, V, U, F, and P, U, such that the U's, a subset of, of this set, which is the C is again a subset of V, which really is just going to, the C is going to stand for confounder essentially. It's going to allow us to talk about confounders that just conflates this definition a little bit. But the range, the important thing is that the ranges here, the range is binary for the, for the, for the U terms, either on and off, and they are uniform distributed. And then the F are feed per neural nets with the parameters theta for each of these variables. That's really the definition. So essentially, you just have an SCM like here. You have the V regular. U is a bit restricted by having binary use and distribution, PU being uniform. And then F, you're just saying it's all for all the variables. It's functions where these functions are neural nets with these parameters, theta VR. Right? That's really the definition of an NCM. I think it's best to look at it visually. So that's really the graphical, the schematic uh, intuition. So we have our causal inductive bias. So our graph X, Z, and Y. Um, this uh, bidirected dash arrow is indicating a hidden confounder. And that's the really cool part about this definition. It also captures, you know, non microbial models. So there's some kind of variable which influences both really, right? Which we don't observe. And now you can construct an NCM. That's the graphical de depiction of an NCM. So what is it? Well, you have X, Z, and Y are your, um, where, where you collect your data from essentially, right? Then you have these U terms, which we just put as, well, um, these binary uniform distributed terms. So we can also instantiate those easily. And now we just specify some feed per neural networks, whatever kind of architecture we want to choose. Doesn't really matter. I mean, it does really matter, but it doesn't matter conceptually now, right? And then we just put, one for each of the structural equations, right? So there's one because Z depends on X. So there's this one. And obviously there's always some exogenous term, just go Y it in here. Then there's one for Y, just goes from Z. And because there's the bidirected, this one is the, the exogenous here. And then X obviously doesn't have an error coming in, but it's also dependent on some kind of function. It's again F and here the bidirected error. And that's really the NCM. So what you have here is now three variables, three neural networks. So in the sense, the neural causal model is also just like the ISPN or the CSPN, not just a single model. It's kind of a bit unfair. It's a set of models, right? And here it's actually a bigger set, right? A more capable set. It's a set which scales in the size of the number of, of, of variables that you have really. Huh? Whereas for example, for the ISPN, it's really just two. It's one neural net and, 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 and one SPN. Now, a couple of remarks, noteworthy things about NCMs. So by definition, they are subset from the set of all SCMs, right? So any of them is an SCM, but of course not every SCM is an NCM because I can do an SCM with SPNs as well, and that's not an NCM. At least not according to their definition, I would call it an NCM because SPNs are also neural nets, different story. And then they are also non-Markovian. This is really what I think a very cool part because, well, you can discuss hidden confounding and everything. And then the, the original paper, what it does is go through all these important properties that we have from causality and reassure them, right? To make sure that introducing neural nets now in between doesn't break anything suddenly, not, not no shenanigans, no, nothing weird going on, right? So we have that NCMs can in principle approximate any SCM. That's very reassuring, makes sense, universal approximators, but very importantly, the per causal hierarchy also remains intact, right? They can generate interventions, counterfactuals in a very all natural sense. You know, if you want to do a heart intervention, just go back here and, 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 and just fix the input to a neural net or don't even use the neural net, right? Just use the, the input as in the graph, right? You can just do all these things. Now, just briefly, um, we can also make this a bit more technical. So you see that what kind of notation you might encounter in this original work. So, Obviously, to do all these results, you need some kind of notion to compare NCMs, SCMs, right? 
And we can always say that, you know, two SEMs and one in M2, they are consistent if they match on a given, they're consistent on a given uh, uh, level of the hierarchy if they match on this hierarchy, right? We can just enforce the strict e equal sign, right? Um, don't ask me how you can verify this, right? Because again, you know, say this is L2 or L3, right? Yes, I mean, you have a continuous variable, infinite possible interventions, right? I mean, it's very difficult to check infinitely. You know, you have to prove this mathematically by induction. But, you know, if they agree, if you can show this, then you can say they're consistent. It kind of makes sense, right? They just agree on everything, every causal effect you could ever derive, right? And then by construction of the NCM, you have that then any SCM you can take, you can always find one as an NCM which would be consistent on LF3. And LF3 is always the highest rung. It implies the down rungs, right? The hierarchy goes in one direction, not the other, right? So if they agree on all counterfactuals, they have to agree on everything else, right? And so you can always find that. That's really just the reassuring result. Now, identification is a big thing as we have seen in the past lectures. So having a graph, having some available data, asking whether from that data and given the graph, I can somehow get the causal effect faithfully. And you know, you also need this notion of neural nets. And so we we'll define a neural variant where they say just in the same way, py to x is neurally identifiable or identifiable if any NCM pair that agrees on the graph and the observational distribution will also agree, agree on the fact. That's just the definition, right? If this is not the case, you cannot identify it, right? And it makes sense. And then they prove, you know, that this aligns with the regular definition, which is really just the same. So the, the, the key difference here is that there is an original reference SCM, right? Some kind of ground truth SCM. And that SCM agrees also with the NCMs, at least on, on, on graph on L1. And if that's set it, set it, then, you know, only the NCM pair needs to agree on effect uh, to have neural identifiability. Because, well, that's kind of whatever is possible with the neural net. But then they show that this aligns exactly with SCMs because, well, NCMs are just SCMs, yeah? So make this a little bit visual. Looks a bit complicated, but I'll guide us through. It's very easy. We have one SCM, it's M star. We have two NCMs, it's M1 and M2 hat. We have omega star, the set of all SCMs. We have omega, which is the set of all NCMs. They are obviously a subset of the set of all SCMs. Now there's three different interesting things. There's PV, the observational distribution. We want that all of them agree on that. They point to the same one. Here's the graph. We want to have them all agree on that as well. And now for any pair, if they agree as well here, then we call that effect identifiable, right? And that's really the definition. Again, again, that's a definition. That's not a true statement. Now, a couple more remarks. So interventions in NCMs, I've just mentioned this, it's the same. Markovian NCMs are still identifiable, matches. So really they've done a very faithful introduction of neural models into SCMs without breaking all the awesome stuff. But really I'd call them safeguards because the interesting part now is learning. How do I choose the architecture? How do I optimize the parameters to get a causal model, right? This is what we all have been waiting for, causal AI, right? Like, where is it now? So let's look at an algorithm. I think conceptually, this was to me the, the most thought provoking thing of the work. So this algorithm is showing how you identify in principle, right? So how you can define, uh, you know, identify through training a model, whether, you know, you can actually get the causal effect from the neural model or not. We take as input the causal query, the causal effect that we're interested in. We have some data on the observation distribution as always. And now we have some causal diagram. Here you can always already say, stop, where do I get this from, right? Just like with the ISPN, right? For ISPN, we assumed that we have experimental data. Here we are assuming now we have the graph, right? You choose your demo, right? It's both is bad, right? Um, but at least here, you know, we can say, we can make the argument, hey, there's a lot of cause discovery works, so we can estimate at least somewhat, or maybe an expert knows, right? knows part of it at least. And then the output of this algorithm will be uh, whether this quantity is identifiable or whether it's not, right? How do we start? We set up our NCM with the variables and a graph. Simple, we get M. And now here's the very interesting part. That's really the key routine. We are doing two optimizations, which look exactly the same. 
up to min and max. One is a minimization, one is a maximization. They are opposite, opposite directors. But now, if you push in opposite directions, but you end up on the same thing, or collapse on the same thing, then the effect is identifiable. Because that's exactly what we want, right? We want that the, any model will agree on that. That's what we call to be identifiable, right? And so that's really what's happening here. And so you just do these optimizations, and then if they agree, and if they disagree, you say fail. If they agree, perfect, nice, you got it. Yeah. Now, the thing is, this thing is obviously not easy. There's a lot of shit going on there, right? But let's start. Here, the constraint, right? It's saying that the L1 that you get from your, uh, so the observation uh, distribution that your model, your NCM gives you, given the current set of parameters, is going to be exactly the PV, right? Okay, this is now our data only, but there is, you know, two things, you know. First of all, you're trying to be exact. Again, checking this, you know, difficult. But then you're also trying to be exact with the limit distribution, really, if you care about true causality in a sense, right? Say there is a true SEM, and I will always only observe a sample of that SEM. So I will never have the limit distribution, but this is really what is demanding here, fundamentally, right? Then again, we might have a big sample. Uh, we might be fine with some kind of approximation. So we are still going to get something. It's probably going to be a spectrum, right? But we cannot you know, expect now perfection from this model. I think what's the key contribution of this work is, is really this theoretical uh, you know, um, classification, categorization, characterization of the problem in the real context of Perlin causality, right? Then the other thing which I've not highlighted here now is obviously the optimization itself, right? I mean, everyone who has ever optimized anything will know that's not easy, and that's really the the actual global minimum maximum that you want to have, want to have, right? So yeah, but conceptually speaking, amazing achievement. Now, obviously they've run this and they were able to do some work, uh, simple graphs, toy graphs. So we are in the starting shoes, but hey, I mean, that's how, how research works. So what we see here now are experimental results on deciding identifiability with the previous algorithm. Specifically, what they test is this here on a hypothesis test with different thresholds tau. So they look whether you know the, the NCM where we try to maximize and the NCM where we try to minimize, whether you know they're this agreement is contained with some kind of threshold. If that is the case, we can vary the threshold size. You know, then we say, okay, it has said to be agreeing or it has said not to be agreeing, right? Essentially, it's this part, right? We say not equal, equal, that's the decision factor. And we here we're easing it up a little bit with the threshold. When do we say it's really equal, right? Um, that's what we are testing at. That's also what you see in the middle plots for these different graphs on the top. All of these graphs are in principle identifiable even though some of them are non-Markovian, or actually most of them, as you see, with the dashed arrows, they are all identifiable. Remember, everyone where there's no dashed arrow is always identifiable. The ones with dashed arrows, generally not, but some of them are. And these are some of these examples, for example, this napkin graph and so on. And then here now in these plots, these different colors, right? Blue, green, they are just you know the same formula here, but with different threshold instantiations. And they are classifying after some training iterations, whether you know, it correctly identifies or not. And we see, for example, with the red thresholds, which is, which is the most relaxed, generally after some training, we are always really confident. We converge and we can always predict correctly uh, the, the identification, right? Here on the lower uh, one, we see the ATE, the average treatment effect, the difference between the max and min predictions, and they also converge to zero, essentially. That's what we want to see, so awesome. Now we can do the very same game, but with different graphs. Here are non-identifiable ones. This is the simplest one. It's just a bivariate graph where you have an immediate hidden confounder on those. This you cannot never identify. And what you can see is simply, if you look, for example, at the AT difference, it's always going to have, there's always going to be some kind of threshold where there's always going to be some value. It's going to stay constant, but it's always going to be high and have some kind of value. Um, 
that you see, for example, your correct ID uh, 100%, for example, from the get-go, that's just uh, an artifact of how the specific experiment is set up. But really, that's that's how it's going. So we can now, again, do the same thing with the pros and cons. I'd say awesome NCMs are actual SCMs. They are really the causal models, and, and you can actually use them. Training with standard techniques, again. And, well, natural extension, a perfect, you know, Categorization in terms of curling causality. Oh, shit. Maybe I forgot some other pros, and you know, the authors were now just, you know, like, no, I know them and we are friends, so we're all good. But yeah, so uh, the con obviously is now, it's kind of like, that's why I also chose this pair now to, to kind of highlight two very different ways. Inference, as in computational and not causal inference, is intractable. And well, they're still difficult to learn, right? And at least, you know, for SPNs, we were able to show some examples or some more real world esque and complicated uh, data sets. Uh, here so far, we are still restricted uh, to, you know, rather simplistic ones. Okay, so I think that's a great opportunity to, you know, ask some maybe other questions or give some thoughts. Yes. Can you explain again how the audio comes on? Like so I think best is just to go back here. I think it's easiest to understand, really. You're modeling confounding just like here. You have U and you just, just put it here, right? And that's it. You just wire in the input, right, to two neural nets to induce confounding, right? And because it's a U term, it's hidden confounding. I was not talking about when I don't know the U again, right? Like I'm assuming now I know the graph. This here is what I'm giving here. This, this, this on the left, I'm constructing from the thing on the right, right? And, and on the right, I have hidden confounding and I know that I have hidden confounding because I have this error. I know that there is hidden confounding and, and on which variables there is, right? And that's everything you need to know, right? Typically, we would not even know that there is a bidirected edge maybe here, or we would put it everywhere because we cannot exclude it, right? That would imply that you put these use on all these, right? And that's essential. I myself have, well, I would have to ask Kevin or Kaijan, right? I mean, they are really the experts on, on these NCMs. They, they developed it in, in this kind of setting. Um, the distributions and things with the uniform, everything is actually what makes it powerful because with this, they can actually prove their results on, on you know, the universal, universality of, 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 of the NCM, right? That everything matches. Um, whether it's then maybe restricted for the learning or something, I don't think they had an analysis on this specifically and I would also not know, also not have any intuition there. Is there also a way kind of quantify you can there is works i've just recently at nerves discussed with one person who has done some work in trying of capturing hidden confounding also in our internal reading group we are just reading a paper on this so there is works it's independent of what they are doing here right however now the combination of this and what you were just saying would be to look at ncms and look at how they might be telling us something about what kind of uncertainty they are capturing, right? I think that's why maybe something like SPNs or just probabilistic circuits, which actually have proper probabilistic semantics from the get-go, would be but the more natural candidate to do an NCM style approach because they actually can quantify more easily their uncertainty, right? Obviously, different types of uncertainty, right? Aleatoric, right? And so on. But... Um, that's future research. So if you still have master thesis open, yeah, you can stop by. <laughs> cool. Anyone else on any of, of these things here? If not, then I just want to conclude with a couple of last slides. Let's remember this causal inference pipeline. This is now again inference, not in a computational, but in a causal way. So this middle section we typically call causal inference, right? Yeah. What is it? Well, unobserved reality, space of all SCMs. There's one true one, which we care about. And that one induces one observation. It implies one graph out of the respective spaces of all. 
And now our task, the task of causal inference, is to get the causal effect, the PY to X, whether it's identifiable, whether we can get it from the graph and the distribution. Is that possible? Yes or not? That's the problem of causal inference. And then estimation is when the answer is yes, you get an estimate, right? It's this and this formula. Now use your data, fit the model, get the actual effect, which gives you really the curves and stuff, right? That's the general pipeline. And one cool thing about an NCM style approach is that you can now, because they are SCMs, do everything in one go. Previously, you know, you relied on having the do calculus say, do the symbolic ID part, right? This identification part, the frontal adjustment, whatever, the causal part. Whereas, you know, our model would do the estimation only, the statistical part, neural nets, SPN, whatever. But what we really want, just like with the NCM, is everything in one go. But because the NCM is intractable, we also somehow want to make it efficient, right? Make it practical. And so I guess the hope really for the future is some kind of NCM PC hybrid. So we have had the separate model now, but now it's up to us and to the future to kind of get them together harmonically. Maybe some other people will just call this neurosymbolic AI. That's why we, in 2022, actually organized the NURBS workshop specifically on neurocausal and symbolic AI because they seem to be two sides of the same coin. But really that's at least from a causal AI standpoint where you end up with, right? And so, yeah, um, ending this one with the 612 estimation where we see someone in the car sitting and saying to their friend on the phone, I'm just outside town, so I should be there in 15 minutes. Oh no, wait, actually it's looking more like six days. Oh no, wait, 30 seconds, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. And that's actually the author of the Windows file copying dialogue, you know, if anyone has ever done that. Yeah. And why is this fitting? I think because, uh, well, we've been looking now at, you know, different models really for doing causality. Yeah. And yeah, there's very different approaches to it. Uh, ultimately, we just want to converge to the truth, right? And, and we all do this kind of stumbling, whether it's the NCM or the ISPN. And with this, here's the key references from day today, just these two ones, although we have talked about a lot more. But these were the two ones we, we focused on. And yeah, thanks again. <laughs>